Hello, and welcome to I Am Dad Podcast with your fatherhood authority, Kenneth Braswell. 30 minutes of wisdom, information, resources, and nuggets to help you on your fatherhood journey. Or maybe you're just curious and want to hear some real talk about fatherhood, family, and the minds of men. Well, guess what? We got you too. Sit back, grab your pad and pen, and maybe even bring a little something to sip on. Enjoy 30 straight minutes of fatherhood, family, and fun with the fatherhood authority. Kenneth Braswell. Hello and welcome to I Am Dad Podcast. I'm your host, Kenneth Braswell, and thank you for joining us for another episode as we continue to delve deeper into the conversation, specifically around manhood and fatherhood and family, um, and talk about the issues that matter most to our families. And this conversation here is a subject matter that, as you know, we are deep in this year um, as we explore the issues of mental health, specifically as it relates to um, fathers, but more generally as it relates to men. Um, And we've been talking about the stigmatisms, the perceptions, the consequences. I've already written a couple of blogs this year talking about things that I have been impacted by. Um, But this gentleman that I have today, Dr. Joyner, Thomas Joyner, he grew up right here where we are um, in Georgia. Um, He went to college at Princeton and he received his Ph.D. in clinical psychology from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, He is the Robert O. Lawton Distinguished Professor in the Department of Psychology at Florida State University, Tallahassee, Florida, in Tallahassee, Florida. Dr. Joyner's work is on psychology, neurobiology. That word's got it. That's a tongue twister. Neurobiology and treatment of suicidal behavior and related conditions. He's the author of of over 795 peer-reviewed publications. Dr. Joyner is also the editor-in-chief of the journal Suicide and Life-Threatening Behavior and was awarded the Guggenheim Fellowship and the Rockefeller um, Foundation's uh, Residency Fellowship for the work on suicidal behavior. How are you today, Dr. Joyner? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? I'm doing fine. Thank you for joining me on this conversation. Um, And it's such a critical conversation um, to have these days. Um, We were, um, there's two um, incidences I want to tell you about very quickly that has really kind of stimulated um, my wanting to dig a little deeper in talking about suicide. Um, One is we just had a retreat for um, 50 of our dads um, to talk about stress and resiliency and depression and mindfulness. And one of the presenters, um, Tamu Smith, um, is the sister of, um, wow, her brother's name just jumped right out of my head. He was an actor on the Disney show Jet Jackson. Um, He committed suicide about three years ago. And I interviewed her some months ago. And one of the things that struck me in the conversation uh, was how um, they didn't see it. And you talked about, you're talking about that in your book, how family members, how we're able to kind of, particularly men, are able to mask um, what's leading them into, you know, into that behavior. The second incident that happened, happened on Thanksgiving that really, really triggered me. And that ha- and it happened here in Atlanta. Um, there was a domestic call to a house in Henry County. The police showed up um, and there was a dispute between a dad and obviously the mom and the two children was in the car and he took off in the car. Um, and they caught him or they caught up to him in Clayton County. And when they caught up to him, whatever ensued at that moment, he um, turned it, he pulled out the gun, um, um, murdered his child in the front seat and then mm-hmm. turned the gun on himself and murdered himself. And so he never um, did anything to the child. But we know what that trauma is going to be like for that child for the rest of his life. And what struck me, Dr. Joyner, in that whole scenario, and this is what I was laboring on, is, you know, what gets you to the point that you hate someone more than you love your children, right? And then what gets you to the point where you really believe that killing your child is the answer to whatever it is you're dealing with? And then what 
happens as a result of the traumatic response once you do it and realize what you've done, which is the consequences then to turn the gun on yourself and kill yourself because at that moment you realize what you did. So those are the two things that's really, that's just driven me around this conversation. And I want to have this conversation more deeply. But before we get into this conversation, there is something that I do with all my guests and it starts off our conversation and really sets the tone for us. And that is, what's your daddy story? Tell me your daddy story. Uh, my own father? Yep. Mm -hmm. It's a tragic one, unfortunately. Um, at the end of his life anyway. But... You know, his life wasn't all tragedy. He was a, a very brilliant man, a very prosperous man, very entrepreneurial man, lawyer, businessman, um, great outdoorsman. And I, I learned so much um, from all of that from him and inherited a lot of that from him, you know, both, you know, by observation, but also genetically, uh, tragically. He also had bipolar disorder and it killed him. He uh, took his own life at age 56. This is in there in Atlanta in, in 1990. Mm. Is that the um, incident that drove you into this work or was there something else that kind of led you really into looking at suicide and then writing this book? Something else originally. I mean, actually very much along the lines of the questions you were just posing. The, the very profound questions of how in the world does anyone get to a place like this? Um, it, it's just so puzzling and, and unsettling and, and also just very deeply tragic and shattering for families. So it was originally questions like that that drew me to it. Um, I think it's a very profound question about the meaning of life itself, actually. Mm. And so intellectually, that's what drew me. But then, you know, fairly soon after that, within a couple of three years, my dad died by suicide and that made it very personal. Um, and so that drove me for sure. But the original impetus was more more the intellectual questions, the profound ones that you were that you were posing a moment ago. Mm -hmm. When you look at your work and you look at what you've studied and what you've learned, what are the nuances that are different for men who commit suicide as a as a um, as opposed to women who commit suicide, I, I view it as a very human um, quandary and 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 deeply deeply tragic catastrophe for for human and human families, and, and you know it, it does affect people, um, you know, of all kinds, of all types, of all backgrounds, um, you know, and you can you you can view you know, gender is as non-binary and non-binary people do have struggles with, with this, but, but there's also one inescapable fact and it's that the vast majority of deaths by suicide do cluster in men. And, and that, that poses a question right off of the Why would that be? Especially when you consider that the, the, the rates for, for one of the drivers of suicide, namely depression are, are the other way around. You know, women have more depression than men, it, which follow you would think that they would have more suicide, therefore, but if they don't. It's completely flipped. Mm -hmm. It poses an important question. And one focus of my work has been <clears throat> it has been to, to underscore the, the, the life and death nature of, of suicide in, in, in raw in its rawest form. That sounds like an obvious statement. Of course, it's a life and death question, but Actually, many discussions of suicide are very philosophical, you know, intellectual. They don't really face the reality that we're talking about killing. We're talking about staring mortality and death in the face and not blinking. And, and, and that's one of the main contributions of my work is that that quality is needed to die by suicide. Most people happily, fortunately, don't have it. And so they, they can't die by suicide, even if they want to. Desperately, mm -hmm. they can't because they they just can't face that, and it's understandable. It's wired into us. Mm -hmm. There is a sub group though who can steer it down, and, and men have more of that quality than than women do. And so I think that's maybe the essential difference mm -hmm. is it's not that men conceive of their deaths 
more often. Really, if anything, it's the, the opposite. Mm-hmm. But but rather, it, it's that having had the idea of it, men are able to act on that idea and bring it forth into action and into reality more so than 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 new women. Mm-hmm. I was having a conversation with one of my um, staff people, a good friend, Dr. Stacy Boucher, today. Um, and she has dealt with, you know, you know, bouts of um, ideation, you know, with thinking about suicide and, and from her life. And we were just having this conversation today because I was telling them about me, you know, speaking to you. And I said, you know, one of the things and I said, and I don't know this to be true. I'm going to pose the question to you. I said that I'm going to be, you know, extremely generalizing, but it really I'm trying to make sense of this. Uh, when it comes between how men and women think about that. And I was looking through my own lens because I considered committing suicide um, when about 20 years ago um, before I made the decision not to do it. But it was my faith that got me to thinking differently. But what I said to her is that it seems to me that in general, um, women will think more about who they're impacting by taking their lives and who they're leaving behind more than men think about that. And she said, that's absolutely not true. She said, and I said, and and I said, no, I said, I, I think that is true. I said, okay, let's just say for a moment that that may not be true. Then my second question is, let's talk about the depth of depression that we're talking about to which both of us actually decide to commit suicide. And I think that the depth of women's thought about committing, committing suicide runs much deeper than, I mean, we give up sooner than they give up. And so is that any part of that true or does it resonate? Part of it resonates in that, um, you know, there, there, a, a, a very, very strong protection against suicide. I mean, as you said, for in your own case, faith can be, and that's true for many people. Another very strong one, if anything, even as powerful or more powerful, is the feeling of togetherness or connection, um, you know, or belonging. And and I've made the case actually in a book, a book, a book length case that men struggle with connection, interpersonal social connection more than women do. And that's true right off the bat from, from birth, mm-hmm. male babies will look at pictures of people's faces less than female babies right off the bat. Um, but it, it gets even worse over time where, you know, you know, you asked me about my dad and, I, and reflecting on my dad's life and his death, you know, it just occurred to me, well after his death that, that, you know, his friends, he had friends when, when I was a little kid, but they just tended to fade. And then, you know, by the end of his life, they, they weren't around much at all. And that got me thinking about the role of friends and, and connection and, 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 and family connection and, and how important those are life-saving even. Mm-hmm. So I, from that angle, I think there is a difference. Um, as I said, from right from birth, actually, in, in, in men and, and women potentially having to do with that essential thing. And it, 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 you can, you can view it as it, it's a, it, it's something that, that women worry over more, I guess, but they also benefit very deeply from it mm-hmm. and, and men don't as much. Yeah. I was just literally, my wife and I was having a conversation a few weeks ago. And we were talking about something which kind of goes back to, and I would love to bring you back at some point because I want to talk to you about your book, um, Lonely at the Top, that I just think that's a a whole nother conversation with men, right? And so we were talking and I said, because I did my first show of the year, Um, I always do alone and it's just kind of uh, my thoughts about the previous year and then what's going on in this year. And one of the things Dr. Joy and I talked about in my first podcast this year was this struggle that I'm having with um, understanding and reconciling the value of friends. And I was telling my wife, my wife said, babe, I've never heard you talk about that before. That was really deep. Like what's going on in your head? 
And I said, you know, there's these moments, even with who I am, even with my influence, even with my title, even with the people who swirl around me. I said, do you ever realize that over the weekend, my phone doesn't ring? And she said, no. And she says, what do you mean? I said, no one is calling me on the weekend and asking me, hey, what's going on? Let's go out and have a drink or let's go to the game or let's go this. I said, 95% of my conversations with other men are around my work, right? Or it's around our son's sports. I said, so when I turn my professional life off, like there's no personal life that picks up. And there's a lot of times where that loneliness bothers me um, because it means, because I ask myself whether or not um, I'm alone in this world. And what I want to talk to you about, because I, and it struck me in the beginning of your book when you talked about your dad at the end of his business, on the tail end of his business, right before he sold it, or about his friends not being who he thought his friends were. Like, how do we, when you when you think about that, what does that look like when we really create an environment of loneliness in our head, even when our outside persona and life doesn't look like we're lonely? Yeah, I mean, it's a dark, it, it, it's a it's a difficult and and lonely space. Um, and you know, as as from my dad's head head space, but I. I do think he felt alone and, and even a little bit betrayed and, and deeply, deeply depressed. And when you're that depressed, it's, it's really hard to know if you're perceiving things correctly. It may well be that his fr- friends hadn't changed much, but in, inside he did due to, due to how depressed he was. I, I just don't, I don't think there's any way to ever figure that out and understand it fully. Um, and, and so that's one thing I'd say in the, you know, the, the other thing that occurs to me is just how integral to human nature it is to be connected to each other. You know, thinking back ancestrally, if you were if you were ostracized, you know, back in ancestral days, that was fatal. Um, that meant death if you were if you were separated from from the group. And and so obviously we are, have just this very sensitive, you know, biological, you know equipment in our head that's very just exquisitely sensitive to rejection to to being left out it really deeply hurts and when that happens you know it puts people in a really in a really bad spot i do think men have trouble cultivating those connections over time they come naturally to some people at least early on maybe because of school the way school structure kind of thrown together with everybody and and then once the work life starts, you got you do need to actively cultivate friendships and, and other social connections, or else they'll just kind of go away. And I think that's what happened to my dad. I think it was fatal in his mm-hmm. case. Um, and I just think women they just naturally, I think, know better than than to let that happen to them. Mm-hmm. Do you struggle with one of the things that um, Tamu said to me about her brother? Um, after he committed suicide was even all the way up until today. They have a sense of why, but they really don't know why. Like, is that something that you still don't have, which is a very distinct and laser focused why? I think I think I sympathize with that view. Um, there's a sense in which I know why uh, I, I think his mental disorder killed him. Um, so that that part is pretty plain to me, but but I, I think it inherent to it is a kind of frustrating, uh, really deeply sad um, acknowledgement that there's just a part of it that you'll never know, mm. and, and I, I certainly feel that. Mm. Um, I think you mentioned that that, that that her her brother died by suicide three years ago. That that's really in the scheme of things very recent no, no wonder it still hurts it still hurts me about my dad that was 30 uh, 31 years ago mm-hmm. it's just one of those things that it's it's shattering 
and people come back from it really i I came back from it for sure Mm -hmm. um but that's different than saying you ever forget it it ever goes away it doesn't not in my experience Mm -hmm. what are the signs you know because that's the thing that always strikes me and and you know and i and i even when i hear the signs and it's like man you know but still like we like we still men have a way we have a way about us that we are really good at hiding and suppressing and um smoke and mirrors right and so but when someone says i didn't know what to look for like what should they be looking for i mean sometimes it is on the surface and when it, when it is on the surface it, it looks like well well i mean there there are some pretty pretty clear warning signs like a, a sudden change in in sleep ability to sleep you know somebody who you know, for most of their lives, I had no trouble with sleep. All of a sudden, they, they're, they're, just, they're just, you know, plagued by uh, inability to, to sleep, by, by insomnia. That, that, that's actually a pretty, pretty important warning sign. Any change like that that's drastic and that's really troubling can, can be a clue that, that somebody needs at least checking in with. So it can be on the surface like that. And, that, and that's easier because at least you can see that and, and ask about it and and, 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 you know, maybe provide some guidance or encouragement for somebody to connect with a mental health professional. Mm-hmm. But, but when it's not on the surface, it's very tricky. And, and the, one of the best things I can say about that is we just have to urge, you know, everyone, including men for sure, especially men, you could argue, that you got to connect, you got to reach out, you got to connect, you got to form relationships where you can tell somebody the worst things that are going on. Maybe that's a clergy, maybe that's a clergy figure in one's life, or maybe it's a family physician or a, a friend from back in childhood, but but it's gotta be at least somebody. And, and, and if you don't have that, that's risky. It's dangerous because you keep all this inside and then all of a sudden it can blow up and, and end in disaster. Mm-hmm. You know, when uh, one of the things that I've been hearing now um, is that suicide rates are actually going up for younger people, like it's really going through the youth for younger people. I've always thought that, you know, one of the stimulators as it relates to even considering that is this lack of hope that, you know, when hope disappears for you. Um, and you don't believe that there's anything for you, you know, in this life, that your life then has less and less value. Um, in your work, what do you what do you think is happening in society that younger people are giving up hope? I mean, I, I, I would just emphasize what you said is that hopelessness, when people are talking about such themes, it, that is that's another warning sign um uh, to be sure and a, as for a rise recently i would I, it's it's so complicated it's it's difficult to venture a guess um about you know overall changes in society and you know some of it's economic and cultural i i, I really don't know I, some of my colleagues and i have made the case that you know, overdoing it with social media is not helping. Mm. Um, it, it takes young people away from what, you know, the natural buffers and, and, and promoters of health, namely being outside with your friends in the sunshine, moving around, getting physical exercise, uh, sleeping as much as you're supposed to sleep. All that can be undermined by social media not not any social media some of it's fine some of it's good i I mean just extreme excessive you know hours and hours and hours and hours every day um that's being overdone and this i don't think it's a helpful part of the mix culturally and societally these days um beyond things like that i'm not sure and one thing i would say is if it's true that there's been a rise in in mental health problems generally including suicide and younger people that's right. What's all, what remains true, though, is that with regard to suicide deaths, it's still a very age-linked 
thing mm. in the sense that older people die by suicide at much higher rates than younger people, even despite that recent rise in, re, in, in mental health problems in, in younger people. Wow. Um, when you were writing your book, I'm sure that there were some things in there that became aha moments for you or aha epiphanies for you. Like what parts and what pieces of this conversation like made you pause for a moment when you discovered them? I, I guess the main piece would probably be that understanding and, 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 and just kind of mining the depths of the idea that, that a kind of, a kind of fearlessness is needed. Um, it, it sounds strange to say, and it can be, it can be distorted what I'm saying here. I'm not at all saying that this is a good thing or that this is a courageous thing, suicide. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is that obviously it involves a kind of capacity to face something horrific. Killing another person is what we're talking about. And that's horrific. That's, that's just wired into our natures that we, we recoil from that. And, and suicidal people daily do recoil and it saves their lives. Mm -hmm. And it, it really was a flash of, you know, kind of, it was a moment of that kind that you described for me when I, I started thinking, let's flip that around. You know, some people naturally recoil. That's, that's, that's how we're wired. Of course they do. Let's flip it around and say, why is it that some people don't? Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's where I started to think about concepts like fearlessness and, and the ability to, to tolerate pain and, and what might, might promote that quality and, in, in people, and in particular in in men, um, you know, we talked at the outset a little bit about why it is that men have this capacity more so than than others. And I do think it's partly it's in, it's inherent, but I also think we have experiences men do physical experiences that are that are just more common in men than in other people. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned my growing up there in Atlanta, which I, I did. I love Atlanta. Um, born and raised, and, and and I grew up playing football there, and that that's that'll teach you physical endurance and physical. Mm -hmm. It'll teach you physicality, and and that's just a fact that, that we men have that experience, and ex other experiences like that more than than others do, more than women do. Mm -hmm. And I I just think that kind of thing is relevant because of how physical suicide, by definition, is. Yeah, you mentioned, you know, when you talked about um, social media, you know, as I was rolling through <laughs> looking at my son in the morning in the face of his phone all the way from home to school and then come back home and him and my nephew on PS4 after they do their homework for half the night. Um, I'm wondering whether or not the lack of socialization has a lot to do with how our children are not connecting um, to people and coming up with ways to be able to um, fight against how they're thinking about their own mortality. Well, I mean, you know, there's something to old old sayings, like all things in moderation is, you know, kind of old cliches, but there's something to it. And, and that's the way I feel about kids and social media is, is okay, but in moderation and, and, you know, moderation would allow the, the good parts of connecting, you know, online, like you mentioned gaming, gaming together. That, that's a form of social connection, and that can be a buffer protection. And that's that's good, and also it's fun and, and entertaining, and, and that's fun too. I mean, that's, that's good too. Um, you know, so in moderation, okay, but I'm worried about these excessive hours per day, to the to the de, to the detriment of other things like real friendships and 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 health promoting things like getting outside and moving around and having sunshine and connecting to friends and and also sleeping enough. I, I'm worried about those kinds of you know knock on effects you might say that social media is having on other things that would protect kids and and social media is kind of working to chip away at those and it, concern, it concerns me. I'm not trying to be puritan about it. Like no kid should ever do that or be on this or that platform. That's not my point. My point is that it can be over like anything. It can be overdone 
And, and if it is overdone, I think it can be a, a risk. Mm-hmm. You know, one of the bigger factors today when we think about suicide is the stigmatism specifically around issues of mental health, right? In order to get to talking about why one might commit suicide, they first got to address whatever the mental issues they're going through in the moment, right? Whether it's stress, depression, shame, any of those things. Um, Some years ago when I did my documentary on um, fatherlessness, um, I had a chance to interview Ayala Van Zandt and we were talking about um, um, the emotions of particularly young boys who could not express the pain and anger that they had as a result of not having their fathers in their lives. And one of the things that she said is that, you know, until men are able to develop their own language to express their vulnerability without um, feeling like they're giving something up or being perceived as weak. Um, they're always going to hide that until society gives them the ability to be able to express those things without feeling weak. When you think about those stigmas around uh, mental health, um, how much of an impact are stigmas still having on men even addressing some of the precursor things before they even get to thinking about suicide? It, it, it's still an issue. It, it remains an issue. It, there was, uh, you know, back, my dad died in 1990, and and back then it was an issue for sure. And, and uh, of the, uh, you know, the, the most painful thing was his death. There's nothing com- that compares to that in my life anyway for how painful it was. But but what also made that a very dark and difficult time was the stigmatization that my family experienced because of the suicide. Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, that's just—it's just an outrage. It's a moral outrage, but it happens, and it's—it it happened back then. It still happens. That's the bad news. Um, the good news, I think, and, and that's one thing about this generation of young people that I'm, I'm encouraged by. Well, there's not just one thing, but it's one of the things, and it's that they're open. They're more open than than our, our generation ever was about these things. And to me, I think that's a very encouraging. Um, hopeful sign for the future that if, if that continues and if they continue to be open and, and you know, very favorable towards uh, mental health treatment and, and emphasizing mental health, prioritizing it, I'm, I'm encouraged by those trends and I think they may culminate in a, in a, in progress on, on the mental health front. Things like lower suicide rates, which we have, we've struggled to do in the United States at least. Um, and their generation, I'm hopeful that it may turn it around because they they are more open about it. Um, and 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 you know the the other angle on this is is a very true one is that these like you know I mentioned my dad had bipolar disorder. These conditions are medical in part medical. We got biological roots. It's just wrong it's it's ignorant even to view them as you know not a, an illness that they're they're not only mm-hmm. an illness they're deep deep often fatal illness and cause at least as much misery as other mm-hmm. forms of of illness so if we can keep sounding themes like that i think we can turn around what is this to this day still stigmatized um, I, I, I have been doing for the last 15 years a lot of work with the military, and they've been very concerned about this issue because, uh, you know, the openness there has not been, you know, encouraged over over time. And, he, and even there, I see real progress. Mm-hmm. So I think the, the good news is the is the progress we're making on openness and, and so mm-hmm. forth. And I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful about that. Yeah, we're actually getting ready to look at doing some work here um, at Fort Bennett. Um, Hopefully, you know, we're open enough and we can get on the base to begin to start providing some fatherhood services um, for our military dads. But I could tell you that one of the closely associated um, cohorts of men that mirror um, military men to a certain extent is men who are coming home from incarcerated backgrounds. And so um, I've been having spending a lot of time talking to dads. Um, have you done anything with 
examining and looking at what's going on with our with those with those men? We have we're we're currently doing work uh, with colleagues uh, from the Department of Corrections in Illinois, and um, we're in conversations to do that same kind of work with the Department of Corrections in the, in the state of New York and with the state of Florida, where I'm located. So it's really active, um, and and we haven't made a lot of progress yet, but we're we're because we're just starting out with that research program. But the reason that we're focusing on there is the is the risk and the rate. It, it's considerable while still incarcerated. And then any kind of major transition like that, where you're coming out of one challenging kind of environment into another environment that also has a lot of challenges, it's a time of potential risk. Uh, people coming in, out of the military into into civilian life as a veteran, that, that that's a clear transition point that, that most veterans navigate very well, actually very well. But there's a subgroup that really that really struggles. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I can see that same kind of model applying to people who are who are going back from from being incarcerated to not being. Yeah, there's these nuances that we did last year when we did our fatherhood conference. We had actually two panels um, of formerly incarcerated or returning citizens. My board president is one of them. Um, And Bishop Ferguson has always like told me stories about when he came home and the things that he had to deal with when he came home. Um, and then there were these stories of some of the other dads and the one, um, Dr. Joyner, that really stands out in my mind's eye is one of the guys was talking about how after, I think, can't remember how long he was in prison, 12 years, 15 years, however long he was in, however long he was in there. And he was talking about the culture that you have to adapt to, you know, when you are incarcerated and, you know, and the the, the sexual culture to be more specific. (laughs) But what he said was, so when you get out, you know, people expect you to come home and be normal um, and transition back into society. He says, but who do I talk to about the experience that I just left? Um, because we don't talk about it amongst ourselves, meaning other folks that are coming home from being incarcerated. And we definitely can't have that conversation with our family members. And we more definitely can't have that conversation, you know, with our friends. And so there's this kind of like mental, even when physically they have been released, there is still a mental lockdown that stays in place, you know, for them when they come out. And I know that for many of them, you know, I go back to the movie Life. I don't know if you ever saw the movie Life. Um, And it always takes me back to this moment when one of the individuals was, he was getting out of jail. His, his, um, His release date was the next day. Um, and he was kind of in that lifestyle in the jail and the, right as they were sitting there talking about it, they wasn't supposed to cross over what was called the gun line. Um, and he just took off and he just started running and crossed the gun line and they killed him across the gun line, you know, which was his mind saying, I don't have it in me to go back to there is no normal for me. This is normal, you know, going back there. Um, have you seen, you know, cases in the men that you've spoken to or in the folks that you've spoken to have these kind of mental lockdowns where they feel like they don't have anywhere else to turn and the only option they have is to take their own lives? We have, and I mean, what you're describing is, a very, it can be, often is, very lonely, very isolating, and and all the more reason that that I, I can think of three potential solutions, and and, and we we see this in a really different context, but with some similarities in the military, where when people come out into civilian life, the, many of not all, but many of them really feel that the only ones who can understand them is is a fellow veteran, um, and 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 therefore a connection to fellow veterans, peer peer veterans is key. 
uh, for them and, and, and sustaining for them. And in some cases, they can talk about things, difficult things that they can't talk with anyone else about. And, and so that's, that strikes me as one option to the very difficult dilemma you're pointing to. Another one is, is something I mentioned a little while ago about, you know, professionals like clergy and like family physicians, where they, they, they can really hear and understand a lot uh, because they do it on a daily basis. They hear everything about human kind, human nature, and and so cultivating that trust with, with someone like that might be a potential one partial solution there. Mm-hmm. Other than those kinds of things, though, it's a really difficult mm-hmm. dilemma. Wow. Dr. Joyner, thank you so much for um, sharing your insight. Um, Dr. Joyner's book is called Why People Die by Suicide. Um, you can purchase his book on Amazon and I'm sure a number of other different places. He has several books um, that I'm interested in. Um, but thank you so much for having this conversation. The last thing I want to ask you is, so for that individual who is listening to this podcast and they're on that fence, you know, where they are, contemplating, you know, whether or not their their life is worthy um, or they're worthy, you know, to be amongst the living and whether or not they believe that the earth or the space would be better off without them. Um, what would you say to that? What would you say to that individual? Stay. You know, by all means, stay. We need everyone. You know, if you're a religious person, everyone's born a child of God, every single one of us. If you're not a religious person, every single one of us has an inherent dignity and worth without, without exception. And, and to, to deny that uh, to anyone, and including to deny you know, it to oneself, is just, it's not proper. Moreover, the, the, the shearing and shattering and long-lasting decades, I can attest, lasting effects of this on other people, it's just not right. It's just not worth it. Uh, and there's some options. It doesn't, and when, when you get to these places, it doesn't seem like there's any choice, any, any options, but there always are. You can reach out to clergy. You can reach out to family physician. You can reach out to a trusted person from from back in the day or, or, or from currently. There are always options, even when they're seemingly not. So I, I, would, ur- I would urge people to stay and, and, to, and to, instead of resorting to, to death, to, to try, at least try those things. Mm-hmm. At, least, at least try multiple of those things. And, and then at that point, maybe revisit it, but, but, not, but, but no, it's, it's, it's not worth it. And it, it, it shatters families. It, it just, it just shatters people. And, and it, for that reason alone, I, I would, I would say stay. Wow. Dr. Jordan, thank you so much for joining I Am Dad podcast. I appreciate you. And as my um, bishop always says to me, um, I love you and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. Um, And so um, we will stay in touch. Um, Thank everyone for um, listening to this podcast um, on why people die by suicide. Um, The book is by um, Dr. Thomas Joyner, he's 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 in Florida. He's close to us, and I want to make sure that I continue to glean um, on his expert expertise and continue to support you in any way that we can in advancing and amplifying your work um, out there in the public space, so more people can be healed by the work that you're doing. I know that at the end of the day, that's what this is about. This book is about making sure that people heal um, in a way that they don't use, they don't, they don't, um, they, they don't consider this as an option of, 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 of life's outcome um, to do that. And so when you go to our website at IamDadPodcast.com, we're going to have some links there um, for anybody who wants to have or know any more information, you know, about mental health issues, depression, um, and, and stress, and specifically suicide, and links to um, Dr. Joyner. And so before we leave, can you tell everybody how to get in touch with you and how to purchase the book? The, the the book's probably the easiest is Amazon. Uh, it's it's multiple places, but that that's probably the easiest. 
I have other books too on on related topics. I hope those are of potential interest. Uh, I'm easy to find at Florida State. You know, just Google me at Florida State. My name's Thomas Joyner, J O I N E R, in Florida State, and it, it'll come right up about how to contact me, email, uh, office phone, etc. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Um, listen, you all have a great week, and I'll see you next Sunday morning at eight o'clock. Um, God bless. Talk to you soon. Thank you so much for taking the time to spend with us. You've been listening to I Am Dad Podcast. We hope that you have been informed, encouraged you to think, or even inspired your heart for the love of dads. The conversation does not end here. Come back and join us next week. Same time, same place. Or you can continue the dialogue on our I Am Dad Facebook page. We also invite you to listen to past episodes, learn more about us, and keep up with special activities by visiting IamDadPodcast.com. That's IamDadPodcast.com. Until next time, I leave you with this reminder of manhood from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Because of this reminder, I will always understand that I am dad, period.